so now we gotta get into another aspect of integration it's this is going to be a kind of like what do you want to call it a linchpin attaching segue which is spelled s-e-g-u-e by the way into this next increment which is basically going to be about why integrated why okay and really why it's going to take a while. Now, the question really is begged, you know, we ended with, well, God has a plan. It's pretty awesome when you stop to think of just how much he's going through to implement that plan. But we know what it is. It's definitely integration. He's announced it in a number of places. Daniel 9.24, Ephesians 1, 15 through 23. Um, filling all in all is the Ephesians passage. Daniel 9.24 is to bring together, as it puts it in the English, the end of the transgression, which is not really the right translation. Suntello means to bring together everything to close a trial. Okay. Um, and then you have, um, the, well, Isaiah 55 and Isaiah 54, 1, which is on, you know, sterile bearing kids. God likes to take the opposites and join them. That, I mean, that's what the cross really is. High to low. The high of Jesus Christ and his thinking, the high of his nature being God, man, linked to the low of our sins. Now, for us to really come to grips with that instead of just mouthing it on Sundays is, you know, like daunting beyond belief. And we really don't understand what that means. Until you have to do something. Until you have to do something in your own life that takes you from high to low. Then you begin to start to understand at least the idea. Like, if you get hit with cancer. Or somebody in your family dies. Or worse, you or somebody else in your family really close to you gets hit with something that just shuts down their life. But they're still alive and they have to be taken care of. You know, like a stroke. Or it could be something as, you know, seemingly small and, you know, non-threatening as breaking your leg. Or, you know, even constipation. Or a cold that keeps you down for three days. You are shut down. But you're still alive. Your body still has needs. You still have to get up. You still have to go to the bathroom. You still have to shower. You still have to move. You still have to go to the store. And... Boy, oh boy, trying to do the smallest thing is a nightmare. Even though the disease or the cause or the problem is not threatening at all. That's low. That's being brought low. Now, so here you are in your hopefully high-thinking brain with your debilitated body. The last thing you want to do is join that together. The first thing you want to do is cut out the low, cut out the thing that's bad, and go on to doing the high, and you'll argue, well, but I should be doing the high thing. That's the high thing. That's right, yeah. But God is saying, no, I want to join the low to the high. That seems totally immoral when you stop to think about it. So that's what this audio is about, thinking about it. The why. Why does God do this? Integrated why. Now, integration means integration within the self, within the person, within the organism, within the moment. But then it also has an interactive effect of integrating horizontally, integrating vertically, 
integrating diagonally with anything and everything else in life. That's what Suntello is talking about in Daniel 9, 24's Greek. Now, I'm, I'm using the translation first because I don't remember the Hebrew word and secondly because um, it's the Greek word that's played on throughout the New Testament. Soon tallow. Soon means together. Tallow means to bring something to completion. Literally to complete a contract. Okay, to bring a, a contract or a trial issue to completion. To, to fulfill all the arguments, play out all the what ifs, all the permutations, and bam. Okay? That's what integration is. That's the why. Now, I've talked about this before, but this time we're going to go into a new direction. We're going to make it, we got to get into the real personal of it. Later on, I'm going to be covering this, in this from the standpoint of like, why me? Right now, we're just getting into like the orientation, the overview of why. But, what you want to do, starting now, and try to make this a daily habit if you remember is to start playing God. It's the best way to do this. Christianity is in the toilet. Judaism is in the toilet. Theologically, they can't think their way out of a paper bag. They are so childish. They think, oh, uh, that's not right to play God. That's arrogance. No, honey, it's arrogance to avoid it. Empathy is putting yourself in somebody else's place. God says, ye are God. Psalm 82. I did a whole channel on it showing how that channel, how that verse is mistranslated. God wants to have around him those who are equal. Because you know what? You get real tired of playing with the kids. If you've ever had children, yeah, they're a joy. And they're the biggest pain in the neck on the planet. And boy, oh boy, if you can just get away from them for a while and talk to other adults, it would really be nice. God is trying to make us into fit bride. He won't go against volition. So we have this whole eternity of, of progress, never quite getting there. That's what he's working for. That's what the Suntello is, is to get us all ripe. For that moment in time when bing, the rapture can occur. And even then we still have to grow. Because you're never going to really be like God. But there's a certain kind of thought pattern that has to be forged as a structure like a house or a factory. In order for it to, you to be able to turn on the power and have it be running. Hi, your house is in some kind of state of construction. That's what the soul is like into a house. Okay, yeah, you've built the foundation and you might have put up some of the walls. You know, have you ever seen a house while it's being built? Okay, but until it's really built, you can't move in. So he's getting the house of the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, body house, to a state where we can move into eternity. That's why, ultimately. Okay, but for your soul to get built where it needs to go, There's a certain thing you got to do called learn and live on Bible daily. Use 1 John 1 9 under your right teacher. And if you're not doing that, honey, you're getting clobbered. And the worst thing that God can do to you is leave you alone. Do nothing. Because he's the only one who can grow you. And if you're so far beyond the pale and so full of your own self-righteousness or whatever it is. Oh, I'm an atheist now. Oh, I'm, I'm a Catholic now. Oh, I'm a this now. Oh, I'm a that now. Whatever it is you call yourself. You're so far beyond the pale. He'll just leave you alone. And you'll stay retarded. Now. If you're listening to this audio. You're not in that position. You're somewhere in a state of flux. Going down or going up. Who knows. God knows. So. In that state of flux. How do you start making it go. In the positive direction. 
Well, learn and live on Bible under your right teacher using 1 John 1 9. That's the basic mechanic for anybody. And technically, it does not matter what denomination you're in. God will grow you out of it. Same for your teacher. So you don't worry about whether your teacher's right. You just worry about whether God wants you under that one. Now, and you can ask him and he'll show you. Within 30 days, honey, he's real direct. If you don't know after 30 days who's your teacher, you've rejected your teacher. Count on it. Use one John 1 9, go to God and say, I don't think I, I don't remember what teacher you want me to be under, but I obviously don't like him because 30 days have passed and you haven't made it clear. Well, actually, you have made it clear, but I'm not listening. Okay, what am I not listening to? Do that before he hits you with cancer or something, okay? Because he will. Look big on this. There was a death penalty for not observing the Sabbath. What do you think is going to happen to you? But I digress. Now, back on track, learning and living on Bible, using 1 John 1, 9. Okay, but how do you do that? Well, here's one way, among many. But this is a really important way, and it's real hard to do this, but real important. Play God. He says, ye are God's. John 10, 34, and then the, the Old Testament passage he's quoting is Psalm 82. I did a whole, you know, channel on that in, video, in Vimeo. Well, if I'm, I, then I got to pretend that I'm God now. See, you know, I mean, if you're going to become a pianist, you have to practice piano. You're not a pian pianist when you start out. You're doing da 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 over and over and over. I guess you're not a God starting out now either. But you have to pretend. You have to practice being God. In order to grow up so that you're more like God and not so much a child who gets really boring to be around after three or four hours. Mommy, 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 mommy. Oh, please, let me sit down for a few minutes. Let the children go away, go to sleep now, take a nap now. Hi, give up. I really, really want to see another adult. You see? God is tired of us being childish. But he's willing to do whatever it takes as a good parent to get us there. And it's going to take all of eternity. And every single day, we'll get closer. Okay, but how is the best way to try? Practice being God. We're supposed to be Christ-like, right? He's God man. Hello. Okay, so how do you play God? This is really hard when you start to really face it seriously. I don't know what you have to do to get your mind quiet. Do you walk into a bathroom, keep the lights off, and just stand there in the middle of the bathroom? Do you have to go to a hotel room, walk in the park, take a swim? What gets your brain so that you are focused and quiet in your soul, not thinking about all the other garbage you got for today? And you just start talking to God in that quiet state. Okay, Dad, what do I have to learn about being like you? What is it like to be God? See, this is really why he's doing the integration. Fill all in all. Ephesians 1, what was it? 15 through 23. God filling all in all. God filling all his highness into all our lowness. His word in us, circulating in us. His thought pattern built as a structure, as a house, as a body, so that by eternity start, that structure is something you can move into. Okay, well, he had to be built down here. That's what his whole humanity is about, being built down here. He was just, what was it? He is just as we are yet without sin. That's, what was it, Hebrews 2 or 4? What's it like? Look, and here, here are some you know, practical things to do. And they're really scary to do. And you're going to be really uncomfortable doing them. Because at least I know I am. Look on, on the TV and you see something that you just know is so wrong. Like all those disgusting anti-Semites. I want them all dead. Frankly. I really do. If I was around those people in real life. And I had a gun in my hand and it was loaded. I, I just, it would be almost instinctive to just lift up my arm and shoot them. I wouldn't even think about it. 
course, that's wrong to do. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. He just introduced that. What was it? Leviticus 19.18. I'm standing in my kitchen, okay? He's throwing the thoughts at me while I talk, as usual. It's wrong. Okay, but he's God. Vengeance is mine, I will repay. So what if it were my job, as God, to decide whether to shoot those anti-Semites? Because there's a contract. As God, I contracted with Abraham that anyone who curses his progeny, I will curse. Well, then it's God's job to curse the anti-Semites, isn't it? So if I'm God, and I'm seeing those anti-Semites on TV, or in the stupid comments to the terrible, to the YouTube videos, or, or, or beta news, or wherever, what if it's my job to wipe them out? I'm God. I made a contract with Abraham. Abraham is in heaven, and he could say, well, God, all these anti-Semites, why are you letting them live? So I'm God. Now it's my job to carry out the very thing that as a mere common or human, I shake my fist at the TV or at the computer reading the comments and I'm and seriously, I know in my soul that if I were standing right next to that person with a loaded gun, I would fire. Would be wrong and I'd know that too, but I, I would want to do that. So upset I am. Okay, what if it were my job to fire? See the difference? We get so concerned, we'll call it charitably, we get so concerned about the wrongs and the evils we see in ourselves very little and in everybody else very much. But what if it was your job to actually police that? That's a whole different perspective. And now all of a sudden, I bet, if it was your job to actually kill those anti-Semites, you would shrink back from it. You wouldn't want to do it. Well, it is your job. That's the kicker. Ye are gods. Whatever he is and has, you share in. Or in him. How many in him prepositional phrases are there in the New Testament? I, I didn't tell him. Because it's, it's phrased in a lot of different ways. You know, so I, how you search it. I guess you search it in the English. You're in him. Bride of Christ. Part of him. We're supposed to rule with him forever. What was that? Revelation 1, 6 and 5, 10. It is your job. Now, that does not mean, like stupid idiots in history have interpreted, that, oh, well, see, I'm God, I'm, I'm a priest, I'm the Catholic Church, I'm supposed to go and execute, you know, all these people. In the name of God. Not exactly. That's not how the Bible has you do it. It is your job, but not that way. You go to God in prayer. Like, let's say... You're one of those vile pro-lifers. Oh, those hussies, they get in the way with, with, with getting pregnant out of wedlock. And then they just go have an abortion. And so now they're getting away with having had sex illicitly. Okay, fine. You are so upset about that. Why don't you go to God and ask Him to bop them all on the head? Because that's actually your office as priest. You don't like something? You see something's wrong? Then you go to God about it and say, God! I want all those hussies killed! Because they had sex illicitly and that's against your law. That's actually your job not the right interpretation of your job to go to God and ask him that particular question but it is your job to go to God about something you see that you think is wrong so 
I went to God and I said, God, I, this Gorbachev guy, whoever he is with the funny stain on his head, he's dangerous. I want him out of power and I want Russia free so they can get Bible. I prayed that for like six weeks, maybe not even that long. Back in what was it, 1983, 84, when, when I first heard of him. And then I forgot about it. Seven years later, on my birthday, I was stuck in a hotel room in Houston. And I turned on the TV, and there he is under house arrest. And I'm finding out that Russia's breaking up. And, of course, four months after that, the actual papers of Russia's breakup were signed. It was a Christmas gift. See, it was my job. I didn't like something I saw. It worried me, but I didn't quite know what the answer was. I only knew that, you know what, Russia needs to be free. This guy's whatever's going on with him is going to threaten that. I didn't ask for him to be hurt because I didn't, I didn't know that. I, it just didn't enter my mind. And, of course, he wasn't hurt. He was freed, too. No, I barely knew how to spell Jesus when I prayed that. So it didn't matter how good I was or how much Bible I knew because I didn't know nothing. It's an office that you get the second you believe in Christ. You're a royal priest to God. You name your own sins to God. You represent yourself and everybody else to God. That's your office. A holy priest of what was that? First Peter 2, 5, and 9? Might be Second Peter. No, First Peter. In the Old Testament, you could even not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And as long as you didn't have crushed te testicles, and you were male, obviously, you could you were to, supposed to serve as a priest in one of the many different you know formations of the whole priesthood, because they basically did everything from taxes to, um, you know, taking out the the animal dung. The whole family was in charge of what they called temple service, but that included some of the most banal stuff you can imagine. Okay, well. You know, the, the t testicles thing doesn't apply, so it doesn't matter if you're male or female. It doesn't matter if you believe, however, and it doesn't matter if you're a good believer or a bad believer, or in fellowship or out of fellowship, you're a priest until forever. Kind of Melchizedek. Psalm 110. That's the kind of priesthood we got. That's what Hebrews 10 is devoted to explaining. Oh. So you see, you do have the power of God called prayer. Ask anything in my name and I'll do it. The flip side of that is, honey, if you don't ask, you's in trouble. You ain't doing your job. So play God. What if it were my job to kill anti-Semites? Where do I start? What really is the definition of anti-Semite? Going to God in prayer, I can say to God, God, kill the anti-Semites. I did ask him to kill bin Laden and Hussein and Gaddafi and Arafat. I don't remember for sure about Arafat, maybe not. They're all dead. Now, if he listens to a prayer, it's not because of you. It's because of what he did for his son to you. And if some guy who doesn't even believe in Christ in the Old Testament happens to be from the tribe of Levi, he didn't cause himself to be of the tribe of Levi. He was born into it. So were you. Different priesthood, different rules. Same idea. You didn't cause it. It was given to you. So playing God is your job. Now, you'll notice it's a very different thing if it's your job. Hi, now I'm looking at all these apostate Christians, all these apostate Jews, and I can't really say that I'm not apostate myself. 
What do I pray to God for? If I were God, what would I order be done? That's the killer. Think about this. If you're God over whatever you see, and you really are, because you can pray to God that it be done the way you say. Ask anything in my name and I'll do it. Christ said, thank you, Dad. Okay, so what are you going to ask him? You got bill problems? How are you going to ask him about that? You see someone on TV doing something you know is absolutely wrong? What are you going to do about that? It's almost instinctive now. And once you get in the habit of doing this, you'll see, you'll, you'll see the difference in the perspective. Like when I'm driving and there's some car in front of me that starts to skid... Okay, or I can tell you there's a, a, an accident or a potential accident getting ready to happen. I immediately just, without even thinking, Dad, please help that person. Whatever it is you want for that person. Because I don't know what God's will is for the accident. Does he want it to occur? Does he not want it to occur? Why? Because I'm learning my job. I can't say whether that person should crash into the other car. I can't say whether God should give me cancer. I don't know enough. But if I got a rule on it as God, the closest thing I can do is say, God, I want your will done. You got all the facts. I don't have all the facts. And I pray that a lot. God, everything you say this prayer is, I absolutely vote for and absolutely all of Christ's names. Amen. I've uh, got to be, I don't know, multiple times a day. I pray that. Okay, but the next step is to now look at it from God's point of view. Your God. You have to do something about all these cretins running around, including you yourself a cretin. What do you do? And then you go to God in prayer because what you're practicing doing when you pray is you're practicing thinking like God. You're going to God like a ruler. Hi, I rule the entire world right now through him. I'm watching television about some garbage Muslims. Typical garbage Muslims throwing rocks. And my gut as a commoner wants to just shoot them. But that's not what a God should do. So I go to God and I say, okay, God, I want to shoot these people. It's always good to be honest. That's what 1 John 1 9 essentially is. I want to shoot these people. Whether it would be a sin to shoot them or not, I'm not 100% sure, given the circumstances. Likely it's a sin, but maybe there's some way it's not. Okay, I don't know enough, do I? God, I want to shoot these people, but that might not be the best idea, Dad. So I'm asking you to shoot them. If it's the right thing to do. And then as I'm talking to God about it, getting it off my chest. Again, that's why it's like 1 John 9. As I talk to him about that, I'm thinking out loud and I'm saying, Okay, God, it's not necessarily right to shoot those Palestinian idiots. Because their souls are just going to depart the body and then you still have to hear them think. So how is it going to help the situation now or later to shoot them? What's wrong is what's inside their head, not what they're doing with their body. Because they'd be doing something different with their body if what was inside their head was better. Oh. So now I start to behave like God in that I hold back, slow down, do nothing. Because really, seriously, what good is it going to do to shoot them? I'd love to shoot them. If it were up to me and I had, you know, I was able to just act on my impulses immediately. Thank God I can't. I would just fly a nuclear bomb over there and I'd drop it on Gaza. I drop it on the West Bank. I drop it on Iran. 
I drop it on Egypt. I drop it on Libya and Afghanistan and Iraq. See, now all those Arabs are gone. And Indonesia, too. Anywhere Muslims are, I just drop a bomb on all of them. And then they'd be gone. And that solves how? Any problems? See the point? It solves nothing. You can talk all day about, Oh, Brainer, you're a terrible person. I don't care, honey. The bigger and better and much more moral issue is what good does that do God? Their souls are going to keep on living. Destroying their bodies is not going to solve that problem. If anything, it makes it worse. Because, see, you got to develop your soul down here before you die. That's the whole objective of even having a body down here. See, I'm playing God now, aren't I? If God gave me a button, I could just press. And every time I saw somebody I didn't like, I could just wipe them out of existence. Would I do it? The answer is no, because here's why. Oh, but you made the soul interminable. So if I destroy them off the face of the earth, that doesn't solve the problem. See, Suntello bringing everything together for completion. The soul goes on living. You got to you gotta try to do something while they're still in this body so that their soul has a chance. And then if they don't, if they won't, if they keep on saying, no, well, honey, there's eternity, and boy, oh, boy, then they've done it to themselves. This is why doing nothing is the worst thing God can do to you. The worst punishment anybody suffers is to have nothing happen. So they think that they're on the right road. And they are literally destroying themselves before your eyes, but you don't see it until the end. Like all these anti-Semites, just let them talk. Don't muzzle them. There's a movement now. It's what's kind of triggering this audio. There's a movement now that apparently some... Buddy in Israel has gone to Google and said, oh, we want to muzzle all the muzzies on YouTube or selected muzzies who we think their stuff is inflammatory. Don't censor them, Israel. Do not do that. God isn't doing it, don't you? Why? Because he's bringing everything together to a completion. And when you leave the pimple alone, it ruins itself. Have you ever noticed that? I don't know. Do you remember when you last had a pimple? Have you ever had a sore or a boil? Sometimes with boils you have to lance them. But generally speaking, the doctor will tell you, leave it alone. Let it destroy itself. With a cold, let it run its course. I mean, they, you know, they tell you there's no cure for the common cold. Okay, fine. I haven't had a cold in so long, I really don't know. It's been at least 30, 40 years. 30 years. 40 years. Okay? Leave it alone. Let it be itself. Why? Because it dies faster. Why? Because it shows up its own evil faster. We are all sickened. Sickened. We find Islam completely disgusting. Once we know what it is. But you can't know what it is if you don't see it in action. Even the Muslims are getting sick of it. People have left Islam by the millions. They can't necessarily leave overtly. Because... There's a law in the Quran that says that anybody who leaves Islam is supposed to be killed by a Muslim. But they're leaving inside in their souls. God knows who those souls are. So why am I going to want all the Muslims killed when they might just be observing Islam because that's the only way to stay alive, see? As God, I would know. But with the powers of God but not the knowledge of God, I don't know. Now, what is that teaching? If you pray to God for ask anything in my name and I'll do it, playing God, 
then that's teaching you what it means for God to be God. Empathy. Isn't the whole purpose of being a Christian and wanting to be saved so that you can be with God and know God and see God? Okay, so now what's the closest way for all that to happen? What's it like to be God? Now you're seeing him through his eyes. See through his eyes. What's it like, God, for you to be you? That's a way of getting close to him, honey. Of knowing him. And once you start to know him, it's like all this information and junk and garbage that's happening in his life suddenly starts to, like, organize in your head. And you begin to see the whole picture the way he does. And it makes sense now. Why doesn't he do anything about all these anti-Semites throwing rocks at Netzarim? Hmm? Why? Because he's waiting for those little Palestinian kids who are 10 and 6 and this is all they know. And 16, they have no idea. They're shackled to their parents who are training them to be little bombs. Not human. If I just kill them now, then they'll never grow out of it. They might never grow out of it anyway. But do you want to be the one responsible by pulling the trigger? So what do you do? Well, as God, you want to provide every last opportunity without it hurting somebody else. Well, that's a dicey question. Because every day those stinking Muslims live, they're hurting everybody. Okay, but if you can make good on the hurt, then you don't account it as hurt. Like a woman, like Christ said in the New Testament somewhere, you know, when a woman finally gives birth, she doesn't remember her labor pains. In other words, if you're getting something for it, you don't account the pain as pain. He learned through what he suffered. Okay, he learned through what he suffered. He just threw that at me. That's, um, what was it? Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. Emata nepaten in Greek. Okay, there's suffering that actually buys you something, and there's suffering that doesn't buy you nothing, and he's out to make all the suffering buy you something. That's the why. But if you play God, then you start to know what that why is. Once you start playing God, it gets a lot harder to be angry. It gets a lot harder to be impatient. It gets a lot harder to be off focus. Because see, if you're playing God, you're looking at God, you're using all the Bible you know to try to be God. And that gives you a very different lifestyle and approach to everything you do, whether you're watching the, washing the dishes or going to the bathroom or giving a public speech in front of five million people. It's like being an actor. What if you have to play God as an actor? Take that approach. What would you be thinking? What would be inside your head? You can snap your fingers, a.k.a. pray. You can snap your fingers and you don't like the anti-Semites. Fine, they're gone. You can snap your fingers, a.k.a. pray. See, even if you had faith like a mustard seed, faith meaning doctrine, faith meaning you believe in that doctrine, as small as a mustard seed, the smallest of the seeds of all the seeds on earth. If you had that much doctrine and that much belief in it, you could move a mountain. Say, hi, mountain, I want you moved. Hi, I don't like chocolate. Just, I want chocolate banned from the entire universe. And it would happen. I mean, if we're going to believe Christ, if you call yourself a Christian, you're supposed to believe what he said. He said this. He is God. He ought to know. Satan said to him, Hi, speak these stones into bread. Speak them. Stones, bread. They would have all turned, as my pastor liked to put it, they would have all turned to gingerbread. Okay, well, you have that same power. Ask anything in my name and I'll do it. He didn't say ask some things. He didn't say ask the right things. He said anything. Now, as God, if you ask that, you know, all blacks be turned purple, because you're, you know, 
prejudiced. God isn't going to do that. But he'll do something. See, ask anything in my name and I'll do it. That means every kind of prayer you ask, he's going to answer. But the answer can be no. The answer can be, okay, I'll turn you purple instead. Like that famous Twilight Zone episode with Theodore Bickle, who's rat, 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 about all the evil people in the world. At 4 o'clock, they're all going to be 4 feet high. So at 4 o'clock, he was 4 feet high. You have the power of God. And the, one of the reasons to have the power of God is so that you can learn what it's like to be God. So now, when you leave, you know, I'm ending this now. You are going to go do whatever you do. Go to the bathroom, drive your car, finish your workout. Pretend you're God doing that. Seriously, pretend. You can snap your fingers and ask anything in his name. What are you going to ask? If you could zap anything, snap your fingers and it'll be done. What would you do? Think about that every day because your future is supposed to be that. Exactly that. As a king, you're going to snap your fingers and you're going to have minions doing your job. And they will account themselves grateful that they get to even be your minions because you got more doctrine than they do. And they're actually hanging around you because God put them there. And he put them there so they can get more doctrine dripping from your lips. Oh, honey, I hate this future more than I can tell you. But you see why it's a good one. So pretend you're God. Because someday, to some people, you will be.